haven't had much luck with this mic <laughs> in the past. Every time I bend over, it gets louder. So uh, bear with me. Mark Twain once said, <laughs> Oops. Go ahead. Okay. Mark Twain once said when the, his obituary showed up in the, his hometown newspaper, he, he said, well, the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. Well, if you've heard any rumor, rumors about me being a, some kind of special orator, they're greatly exaggerated, too. I'm not a, a public speaker. I'm a teacher, as I told Polly last week. But uh, let's uh, start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can be here. We thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that you brought every one of us here safely. Now, Lord, we pray that you send the Holy Spirit into this service today in such a special way that everyone that is here will know that they've been in the presence of the Lord. And thank you. Well, I'm going to start with a little story because I always have a hard time getting going. So this is about my... Uh, Jesse is not being picked up on Okay. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. I'm going to tell a story about my sister, because she's going to be <laughs> watching this. When we were kids, uh, our dad worked in sawmills around uh, Sandpoint and, and Naples and other places. And he had a lot of friends there that went to church. And they'd invite us to go to, to go to church. So one of his co-workers invited us to go to the Church of God that used to be right on Boyer and 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 uh, Pine Street. Well, my sister was older than I am, but uh, we were oh probably seven, eight years old or something like that. And they were having a special service while the Church of God used to be pretty. Uh, lively and they were uh, down uh, not rolling around on the, the floor by any means but they were becoming pretty pretty lively so my sister wanted to join the festivities so she grabbed me by the hand hauled me off down and threw me down on the floor there and we were down there joining right in. My dad turned white as a sheet, jumped up, ran down the aisle, grabbed us both, and out the door we went. So, and I don't think we ever went back. But, but that's history. If I had to, had to title this message, I say history repeats itself. I'm going to start with the book of, of the Gospel of John. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and that world did not know him. He came to his own domain, and those who were his own people did not receive him. That sounds like a strange translation. Well, that's, that's directly out of the Greek. That's why it sounds like. i got to put my glasses on. I can't see anything. With those words in mind, we can understand what Jesus was feeling when he uh, spoke the lament over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest prophets, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and ye would not refuse. Right before that, uh, Jesus had per pronounced eight woes against the scribes and Pharisees. The word woe, if you look it up in the Greek language, literally means calamity. So he's telling these these calamities are going to happen because of your actions, what you have done. I looked this up in, in the Beacon Bible commentary and the, the uh, author for uh, Matthew said, 
says these words, the pathos of these words defies description. Jesus had offered himself to the Jews as their king and Messiah. The leaders had rejected him and soon would condemn him to death. And the word, ye would not, are the words written as an epitaph of the centuries. What in the world is an epitaph? That's a memorial written into a stone on a tombstone. That's a metaphor for that, that saying needs to be etched into our mind, in our memories. It's interesting, too, that the second word, ye, in that is plural. The, all the other use, uses of the word you are singular, but that specifically is. So Jesus is lamenting it being rejected, but he's looking to the people as he says, but you rejected me. So. There's a uh, famous philosopher named George Santana said something similar to history repeats itself. He wrote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Santana probably wasn't thinking about the book of, of Judges, but there's a connection there. The, when you think of Judges, you think of of people sitting, you know, old men and women sitting around in dark robes arguing about letters, about the law. The judges in in uh, Israel weren't weren't judges. They were they were warrior chieftains that were uh, filled with the spirit of God, and what they did was lead the armies to against the other nations and to protect Israel. But the Israelites had short memories because every time one of those judges would die, the people would forget the mighty acts that, that God had performed through them and they would fall back into idolatry. Well, that idolatry led to their bondage and, and misery and they would repent and cry out to the Lord and the Lord would raise up a, another judge. Well, eight times in the book of Judges, the scripture says the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, eight times. The book of Judges covers a period of about 410 years. Out of that 410 years, 124 years of it was spent in bondage to different nations. The very last sentence in the book of Judges says, in that day there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own sight. That's anarchy, total anarchy. So, <coughs> let's jump forward a few years to the, the anointing of Saul as king of, of Israel. The people thought that that unlike the judges, a king would be able to control the people. The period of the kings was ever bit as bad or worse than the period of the judges. 1,100 years, they fell back into that cycle of, of idolatry and redemption, idolatry and redemption. And finally, in AD 70, with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed, Israel was no longer a nation. The monarchy was gone. So, and wasn't, wouldn't be in a, a nation again until 1948. About four centuries before the destru destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Athens was becoming the leading city-state in, in Greece. Uh, it, uh, the Greek uh, nation gave us many advances in, in, in uh, ma mathematics and, and medicine and literature with people like 
um, Archimedes and and uh, Pythagoras and Euclid. Most of our math today comes directly out of that. Euclidean geometry is from Euclid. Pythagoras gave us the Pythagorean theorem, and Archimedes gave us the law of displacement. He was taking a bath and got up and noticed that the water level dropped. So he ran outside naked in Athens shouting, Eureka, Eureka, which means I have found it. We use the word Eureka today. Meton of, of Athens uh, discovered the length of a solar year. He said it was 365 and 5 19 days. That's one half hour less than what it is. So, so. They also gave us philosophy with Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, but that was humanistic. It was not divinely uh, intended. There's one of the uh, philosophers named Protagoras who wrote, man is the measure of all things. What's that mean? Man is the measure of all things. It literally meant that Everything is what it seems to the individual. That's back to that man did what everything, what is right in his own sight. That was the foundation for democracy. So, what, what's democracy mean? Demos means the crowd, people. And the rest of it is ruled by, so it's ruled by the people. That's good, huh? Well, some would would disagree. This is written by a professor of universal history and Greek and Roman antiquities. Greek and Roman antiquities is, is called classical studies today, and that's my minor, and Vicky's as well, or my major. He wrote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the majority discovers that it can vote itself a largesse from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising those benefits from the public treasury. With that result, a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal college, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years. This <coughs> These nations have progressed through this sequence from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and dependence to bondage. Again, that's a, a vicious cycle. Same cycle basically as what happened in the book of Judges and, and uh, the Israeli monar monarchy. If you study history, you'll find out that that has been the case for, throughout history. Um, people think of Athens as, or as uh, democracy being uh, practiced all over Greece. It was not. But the only place in Greece that practiced democracy was Athens, and just for brief periods of time, because they would have a democracy, <coughs> then they would be overrun by Sparta or some other of the city states, and the policy would change. So democracy really didn't take hold in, in Greece. And in Rome, they had a republic, which is, republic is just another form of democracy. It's just administered differently. And we don't, we think of Rome as a republic. It wasn't for very long. For most of its uh, lifespan, it was, uh, uh, it was an empire controlled by one, one person. The, Caesar, the king. But, uh, 
it's interesting, you won't find the word democracy or republic any place in the Bible. Why? What, what does the word mean? Ruled by man. We're not supposed to be ruled by man. We're supposed to be uh, worshiping God and not man. Well, let's move forward 1,227 years. 1792. What, what does that date signify? That's the birth of the first French Republic. Their first try at democracy. Didn't work out too good for, for, for the France. It was under the governorship, I guess you'd call it, of Maximilien Robespierre. And that time period is called the Reign of Terror because there was just violence everywhere. When they overthrew the monarchy, Louis, Louis the 16th, they also took all the wealth away from the, the churches because the churches were tied into the government. So without any kind of re religious instruction, the people did whatever was right in their own sight again. So at the same time that was going on in England, was going through the same difficulties, uh, violence and, and disres disrespect for the church. But John Wesley came along, and, and Charles Wesley and, and, and Whitfield. And the revivals in, in England kept England from going through that same reign of terror. Well, what about the United States? What was going on in the United States at that time? The Constitutional Convention was just about five years before that. If the Constitutional Convention would have came later during the, the first French Republic, we would have never had a republic here because of, because of the difficulties France had. But I tell a story here. So Benjamin Franklin is perhaps the best known of the signers of the Constitution. On September 17, 1787, the final day of the Constitution, as he was walking out of the building, a woman came up to him, a Mrs. Powell from Philadelphia, and she asked him, she said, well, doctor, what have we got, a, re a republic or a monarchy? And he looked at her and said, short, curt reply, a republic, madam, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Why was he skeptical of that we could keep it? Well, just a few months before, he was at a meeting in, and they were framing the Constitution, and there was a division amongst all the delegates there. The southern states wanted equal representation to the northern states. Well, the northern states had a larger population, so they said they should have more representatives in, in Congress. The southern states had more land mass and produced more goods than the north did. So they were fighting about it, and it about came to violence. The reason we have a Senate and a House of Representatives today is because that was a compromise. Every state has two senators and the House of Representatives is, is by population, by district. But Franklin wanted to stop all this bickering, so he wrote this. He says, I have lived, sir, a long time. This breaks me up. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall 
<coughs> to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, except the Lord <coughs> build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He also wrote in the same letter, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. And as nations become corrupt and ambitious, they have more need of masters. Note he said masters, not leaders. John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington said, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. You can't have morality without religious beliefs. Jefferson, who modern scholars say was a deist and didn't care at all about religion, said this, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a, con a conviction in the minds of the people that the liberties are the gift of God. The founding fathers aren't like they say today, we're a bunch of uh, godless individuals. They are all devout in one form of religion or other. Some of them were deists. That doesn't mean they were atheists. They just had a different concept of God, but they were all religious. Napoleon in France recognized America's success, success with our form of constitution. So he sent a young man named Alexei de Tocqueville to the United States to study the, actually to study the prisons and penitentiaries here. And de Tocqueville found something different. He wrote this, not until I, <coughs> not, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her <coughs> pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power America is great because she is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. He went on to write a book about American democracy, a two-volume book. American democracy has lasted 235 years because of our religious beliefs. I've been reading a book, it was called If You Can Keep It, and another one called A Letter to the American Church by Eric McTaxis. He's a writer. He, I've got four of his books now. One of them's on Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and one of them's on William Wilberforce, and one of them's on the making the drafting the Constitution. And the last one, he compares the parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany and things that are happening today, and it's scary. It's, it's scary. He writes, the government cannot force us to be good. Well, the government tried to force us to be good by the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, Prohibition. It was ratified in 1919 with the idea that sobriety would keep us from falling into more sin, I suppose. Didn't work, didn't work. The period that followed prohibition was one of the most violent periods in American history. They call it the Roaring Twenties. The same year, another uh, document was, was drafted and Woodrow Wilson, president, that signed the, the uh, legislation for the 18th Amendment, was one of the person that drafted the document that started the League of Nations, which was the forerunner to the United Nations today. Well, that too <laughs> didn't work out so good. Because at the same time that the League of Nations was uh, established, uh, 
uh, England and France and the United States forced Germany to uh, sign the Treaty of Versailles, which wasn't too good for them. It forced the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm and laid all the blame for the First World War on the Germans. And in the treaty, they forced reparations on, on uh, Germany and for, forced them to set up what's called the Weimar Republic. It started in 1919 and ended in 1933 when Hitler came to power. I have a friend that was a German professor at the University of Idaho. And I was taking a, a course about that time period between 1870, 1870 and and 1945, it's called German Cultures and Institutions. And he knew I was taking the class and he came up to me and we were talking, he said, he said that era in, in Germany is gone. No, no uh, history whatsoever from 1933 to 1945. I can't find any mention in, in history books there. And he didn't know about it till he came to the United States and he's working on a doctoral degree at the University of Minnesota. He said he was just horrified when he found out about it. He told me, he said, I don't care if I ever go back to Germany. The German people forgot their history. Not only forgot their history, they blotted it out because they were so horrified by what they allowed to happen. Like I say, the book by Metaxas it shows a whole bunch of parallels between Nazi Germany and, and today. I list some of the mistakes that Germany made here. The German church could have stopped Hitler in 1933. They had the, uh, the power that if they would have stood up to Hitler in 1933, he would never, never uh, came to power. The German church had about 18,000 Protestant ministers in Germany in 1933. About 3,000 of them were very anti, were, were rabid Nazi sympathizers, just went along with the, their program. About 3,000 were members of the Confessing Church, along with Martin Niemöller and uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer and others, about 3,000. That left 12,000. The 12,000 that were left didn't care what happened. They just said, go ahead and do what you want to do. And if they would have, that 12,000 would have stepped up, it wouldn't happen. Is that happening in our churches today? I'm so thankful for this church and the believers in this church because we have we have a a foundation in Christ and, and not in government. There was a a word Sündenbach, which means scapegoat. Hitler had used propaganda to blame all the problems that Germany was having, having during the Weimar Republic on the Jews. The Jews didn't have anything to do with it. But, uh, but he had to have that scapegoat to, to blame. And he stirred the German people up against the Jews so much that Hitler was allowed to kill six million Jews. We studied the progression of the laws in in Germany from 33 to 45, and they just kept getting more and more oppressive of the Jewish population to the point that the final solution was that no Jew should survive. The elimination of the Jewish population. There are people today in the United States say that Holocaust never happened. Yeah, it did. I've seen actual pictures of uh, 
of the graves, mass graves in Germany. Are we getting any, we're any way close to that today? What's our moral stand today? You know, just a few months ago, the, the Supreme Court overrid uh, Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade literally took states' rights away from, from the state, said you cannot outlaw abortion. The Supreme Court just a few months ago said that was a bad judgment. There was no foundation in the Constitution that would support that. So they overturned it and gave the right back to the states. Under the 14th Amendment, the states have the rights to their own laws without, unless that law is specifically mentioned in the Constitution. So, but, so what happened? A whole bunch of states just recently have had referendums to make abortion legal again in the state. They're just bound and determined to, well, why? I cannot understand why a woman's right to privacy so can override a child's right to life. It just, it's not reasonable. <laughs> just last week, the Congress, both the House of Representatives and Senate passed a bill called the, right, the Respect of Marriage Act. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? until you know what it is. It <laughs> protects the right of homosexual couples to marry. How is that respecting marriage? That just, that's beyond me. So we're going down that same path as what allowed that to happen. It's called the Fuhrer Principle. People were so mesmerized by Adolf Hitler, that they would give him total power. He was elected as Chancellor of Germany, much like our president or uh, Prime Minister in England or, or other countries with parliamentary government. But, but Germany had a president at that same time, which was a lifelong uh, office. And a man named Otto von Hindenburg was president. Hitler went up to, to Hindenburg and demanded that Hindenburg give him the presidency of Germany, a lifelong, lifelong presidency, and he did. So, so the Führer principle means Führer means leader, but it come to mean dictator, satanic violent dictator. We don't want to go down that road anymore. How do we remedy that? How do we stop that as Christians in this country? There. Holiness. God demands us to be a holy nation. And if he demands us to be a holy nation, can we on our own become holy? No, no. If that were possible, none of this evil stuff would have happened. When God demands us to be holy, he makes a, a way that we can be holy. The Methodist Church has believed in the doctrine of entire sanctification, or it has the churches that I grew up in. That means that you're saved, and your sins are forgiven, but that sin still is there, uh, influencing people. So God gives us the Holy Spirit that cleanses us, and it's subsequent to 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 salvation. And the proof of that is the apostles. The apostles that at the crucifixion just went scattered like a cubby of quail, 
except for one person, John. But that same group of people at Pentecost were empowered through the Holy Spirit and changed the world. Gave them the power to not only testify, but to prove what they were testifying to. Can we be clean, cleansed today? You bet we can, and we need to be. When I was planning on this message, I was, you know, I always were, well, man, mm, I don't know if I could really preach this. And I was thinking that, and about that time, I reached over for a folder of my notes, and this fell out right in front of me, boom. This is a letter from, well, it's the part of Mother Teresa's acceptance speech once you got the, the um, Nobel Peace Prize. It says, it is so beautiful for us to become holy to this love, for holiness is not a luxury of the few. It is a simple duty for each one of us, and through this love we can become holy. The love she's talking about is the uh, grace commandment. Love God with your, all your heart, soul, and your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. And God guarantees us. In, in, in the Old Testament, God says, you shall be holy as I am holy. Well, that's accepted as a command, uh, as a imperative. I looked it up in the Hebrew and I looked it up in my Hebrew grammar. It is an imperative, but it is also just a future. So it's, it's a command and it's a promise. So, so I got one more thing I want to talk about. I brought this book with me. It's called Right Conception of Sin, written by a guy named Richard S. Taylor. And the, and the final page of that, he says, the atonement does not change the nature of sin, but proposes to change the nature of men. It does not take the deadliness out of sin, but takes sin out of man. So, and praise the Lord. By the way, I know this man. I met him personally, and he signed his book for me. So, he was a Sunday school teacher at the Gladstone Nazarene Church when we needed, when Vicky and I were over in seminary. So his wife gave me probably the greatest compliment. She was talking, and her husband, Dr. Taylor, was talking, and he said something, and to this day I don't remember what it was, but she looked at me, she said, I can see that you're a scholar, which is a compliment. <laughs> But it could also mean an insult, too, because the word scholar comes from the word scole, which means leisure, and only people of leisure could study. <laughs> so, well, thank you for coming. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for these people who have been so patient to listen to, as I speak. Be with them in a special way, Lord. May the Holy Spirit be here in such a way that it touches each and every one of us. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.